On behalf of the Center on the Legal Profession and women of, of Stanford Law, I'm so delighted to welcome Katha Pollitt. Uh, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, she's a renowned public figure for her cultural criticism, her provocative columns in the nation, her poetry, and her enormous insights on issues of feminism. She is, um, I wish to say, just on a personal level, the smartest feminist I know. And whenever I'm in need of guidance on a particular issue, she's the first person I look to. And I'm not alone in this. Um, her clear-eyed take on some of the most difficult issues of our time has prompted Barbara Ehrenreich to remark, when she finishes with a subject, there really isn't anything to say except, thanks, Katha, for clearing that up. Uh, she will um, talk for about 20 minutes, a little bit about how she came to write the book, um, give you a little sense of what it says. We'll open it to questions if you come to the mic. And after the session, um, there'll be a book signing outside the door. Stanford Bookstore's um, order did not fully come through, so many of you who want the book may need to get order forms, and there'll be free shipping for you. And it's, of course, available um, by click on Amazon. So uh, I'm really looking forward to Kathy's. Thank you so much, Deborah, for that really lavish introduction. Um, I, I think um, I'm probably not the smartest feminist. I think maybe Deborah's the smartest feminist. I, I've learned so much from her books and um, consult them constantly. Um, I, uh, I was going to read from the book, and I'm going to try to, but I just realized I was rummaging around there because I lost my glasses. Uh, so. I may, it may be a struggle, but I'm going to try. Um, but before I do that, um, I, I want to just say a little bit about how I came to write the book. What, what was I, you know, motivated by? It takes a lot of motivation to write a book, as I discovered when I tried to write one. This is the first book I've written that isn't a collection of essays, and um, it's a lot harder to write, you know, 200 pages about something than. 10 pages about something. Um, so what motivated me was the was two things, really. Uh, one is you all you have to do is open up the newspaper and you see uh, abortion being restricted everywhere. Um, and I'm mean, not everywhere, not in New York State, not in California, which is actually, I have to say, California is a state where abortion rights have been expanding. Um, with Jerry Brown uh, okaying um, non uh, other medical professionals besides doctors saying that they can perform certain kinds of abortions, um, which which will help a lot with um, the problem of access, which exists everywhere. But you know, California, New York State, and a few other um, blue states aside we're seeing abortion restrictions just all over, including in purple states like Pennsylvania, Ohio now has you know one restriction after another. Um, Virginia, clinic, several clinics have been closed. Um, and of course, there's the big scandal of Texas, North Dakota, Missouri, which has one clinic down in the whole very big state full of women. Um, now there is one clinic, and it's in St. Louis, and it has a 72-hour waiting period. Um, so uh, watching that happen, and the not-so-effective political uh, attempt to turn that around politically, both through electorally and in other ways, um, was a big motivation. and. Um, another was, which is related, was feeling that the pro-choice movement has lost its mojo. Um, that while the anti-choice movement is, uh, which I also follow, is 
unbelievably all on the same page, well, not quite, but mostly all on the same page, extremely dedicated, it's on fire. They are just on fire. They are just so persuaded that history is moving in their direction. Um, and they uh, speak as with one voice most of the time. And they have a very simple message, which is abortion is murder. Abortion kills a beating heart, stops a beating heart, um, all that kind of thing. By contrast, the pro-choice movement, it seemed to me, and it still does, although I think they're changing a little bit, um, uh, the pro-choice movement is, is mostly defensive in its rhetoric. So the anti-choice, and this is, all, this is a losing strategy in the long run, because uh, the, the anti-choice movement says, okay, abortion is murder. Our side says, it's a very, very sad thing. Their side says, and women just have these abortions without thinking about it, without knowing enough, without, you know, they're just uh, in a state of panic and confusion, and they just do this. Our side says, oh, it's the most difficult decision a woman ever makes, um, and so on. And what that does over time, it, may, it might be strategic in the short run, it probably is, um, and, you know, all these groups have focus groups and all that kind of thing, so they, I'm sure they've... Uh, shopped around these various messages and found that it actually helps with people who aren't, you know, diehard pro-choicers, what I like to call the muddled middle, that's what I call them in my book, um, people that are okay with restrictions, but they don't want to see abortion banned. They want it to be available like for them uh, and for their daughters and their wives, um, just not for those sluts over there. Um, so uh, over time, that kind of reactive, defensive, concessionary messaging uh, weakens the original point, which is this is your right. This is part of just a inextricable, intimate part of women's ability to function on anything like equality in society, to have a decent life, to get an education, to get a job, to marry the person they want instead of the person they slept with while they were drunk, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, um, or not the person they slept with while they were drunk, the person they think is wrong for them. Um, uh, so that message, which was the original Margaret Sanger point, you know, that just talking about women's rights without talking about reproductive freedom. Reproductive freedom, which is itself, you know, better messaging than rights, freedom, liberty, um, and very American too. Um, to talk about women's rights without talking about reproductive <clears throat> rights as the fundamental piece of it uh, is to really occlude what abortion is really all about. Um, it's both an issue of women's health and so we see it's both an issue of women's health, but it's also this other thing. It's also, it's also about women's status in society. Um, now, even with the women's health thing, there's a problem because uh, the other side will say, um, women, nine months of, what's nine months of pregnancy? What's childbirth? Then she gets on with her life. They have a very rosy view of what, uh, of childbirth and uh, pregnancy and all that. And our side says, oh no, at least, you know, what about women who would die? What about rape and incest victims? And so we immediately go to these very hard cases. Uh, I mean, they're hard if you have problems with abortion, not if you don't. Um, we immediately go to these, these cases that we know most Americans sympathize with. Most Americans do not think a woman should die in childbirth because you know, the Catholic Church says you can't intervene, you have to let God decide who lives. Um, most Americans would be okay, are okay with uh, ending a pregnancy where the fetus is catastrophically um, uh, sick or, and will die soon after birth, an anencephalic baby. Um, or, and they're also okay, to a lesser, somewhat lesser extent, with abortion for rape. But if you look at these exceptions that they're willing to make, what you see is, yeah, 
Abortion is okay if you need it for circumstances beyond your control, a very serious health matter, or you didn't have voluntary sex, according to the very strict standard of what voluntary sex is. Um, so for everybody else, no abortion for you. After, uh, in the book, I discuss polling at, at some length. And according to the summation of polls by, uh, by Gallup, after you get to those voluntary, you know, involuntary sex and very serious medical conditions, support for legal abortion drops below 50%, which is really shocking when you consider, especially, that maybe only at least 90% of, of abortions are for other reasons than that. Uh, they're for socioeconomic, personal, psychological, um, and other kinds of life circumstance kinds of reasons, like somebody wants to finish college, somebody wants to um, get a job or get a better job, or they they think they're too young. It's really amazing to look at these polls and see they say she's. I think I'm too young. Have the baby. You know. I mean, uh, I I'm too poor. Have the baby. I have too many children already. Have the baby. Um, and this is where you begin to see that uh, that kind of defensive messaging, always talking about you know, deaths and childbirth and horrible rape although it does pin the other side to the wall because they, because they think it's always murder. They have to be against those abortions too. It also has the effect of somebody is going to come coming along and say, well, okay, you can have those, those abortions, those good person, good woman abortions, but what about, you know, let's get rid of the other ones. And you have a lot of people who feel that way. And it's only the very difficult um, way, the very difficult uh, way of crafting abortion law so that it would only cover those good abortions and would exclude all the bad, those bad ones, that we, which is probably why we don't see more people suggesting this. Um, so anyway, I, I just began to think, what, what has happened to the original mojo of the pro-choice movement, which was all about women's rights, you know, abortion without apology, abortion for free, um, abortion because that's what you, a woman who is pregnant, think is the best thing for you. Why is that the only decision that, it's the only decision only women get to make, and it's also the only decision regarding sex and reproduction in bodies that is so incredibly fraught. Um, I think there's a, collect, a connection between those two facts. Um, so anyway, so mulling all of this all over in my head, I. Uh, I decided that I wanted to set out a book that would that would try to reverse that whole discourse and say, let's put the accent back where it belongs, which is on the woman and her life, and not talk obsessively about the fetus all the time. I mean, it now is all about the fetus, um, and that's why you can get these laws being passed or proposed in many, many states saying, well, you can have an abortion until they hear a heartbeat. That's Ohio, which is like, you know, so you can have an abortion if you can have an abortion before you know you're pregnant, basically. Uh, um, or uh, um, you can have an abortion, but first you have to have a sonogram, which you would be having anyway. Um, but the doctor has to show it to you, if, even if you don't want to see it. Um, the doctor has to describe to you um, fetal development in great detail, according to scripts written by um, the you know state legis people in the state legislature that are full of mistakes, um, and uh, what does that say? What that says is you, a woman, are really not competent to make this decision. You can make a lot of other decisions, but you can't make this one. Um, and what's especially enraging about that is that the picture of the woman that, that all those restrictions uh, have in mind is a woman who is acting in an impulsive and ignorant fashion. But actually, most women who have abortions are mothers. It isn't, you know, the, the picture, the teenage slut, the 20-something who just wants to you know, have fun until she's ready to settle down, the... Um, the evil career woman who hates children, 
and has to have an abortion so she can go on her European vacation. It's always a European vacation. I always think that's really funny. They never say, well, I have to go camping in the Ozarks with my family. I'm having an abortion. Or I have to go take care of my mother in Georgia. I'm having an abortion. No, it's always, you know, I need to go on my, my fancy elitist blue state vacation. <laughs> um, so um, if people, I, I, I just had the idea, if people really knew that's always, you know, that's what journalists always think. If people only knew uh, what I'm about to tell them, everything would be different and how rarely that actually happens. But um, I did think, even if people knew and had to deal with the fact that 60% of women who have abortions already have children, would that make people think about it differently? Um, if they knew that 40% of women who have abortions are poor, and 20% more are near poor, and poor is defined very low um, in our statistical, um, you know, in our statistics, uh, would that make a difference? If people just had more of a sense of what women are up against in life, um, because it can be very hard to see if you're not up against those things yourself, or sometimes even if you are. Um, so I had the idea that if I wrote a book that laid all this out and said, you know, we've got to talk about women and women's lives and uh, who gets to make this decision, um, then maybe the discourse would be a little different. Um, and I also thought, as I, as I continued writing, the idea of stigma became very important. Um, why don't people know these things? Why do people think, I don't know anyone had an abortion. You know, abortion is for those sluts in New York. Um, they don't, they probably do know someone who had an abortion, maybe more than one person. But they don't know that because the stigma of abortion is so great that people don't talk about, women don't talk about it. Um, they're very, very careful who they tell. And a uh, wonderful sociologist named Sarah Cowan, whose research I I used in, in the book, um, found that she compared, okay, people who've had miscarriages and people who've had abortions. The people with miscarriages tell people much more freely than the people who've had, people who've had abortions. And they get a lot more sympathy. Um, the people who've had abortions are very, very careful about who they tell. They not only tell people they think are going to be sympathetic to them, but people who, whose networks will be sympathetic lest that person tell someone who is unsympathetic. And the net result of that is that pro-choicers think they know, know a lot of people who've had abortions because people are telling them. And anti-abortion people know very few people who've had abortions because people don't tell them. And that means that the people who, need, who might be a little more tolerant if they had a broader sense of what was going on don't get that information. Um, so, not just I, but many other people think that if women were encouraged more to speak about abortion, speak about their own abortions, um, and be more, uh, you know, um, upfront about their pro-choice politics, which is another thing people tend not to talk about if they live in an anti-choice part of the world, um, then maybe, uh, the stigma of abortion would lessen, and that would help the whole political situation because people would be able to, uh, you know, fight more openly for what they think is right. Um, what we have now is really the worst of both worlds because the people who mostly speak about their abortions are women who regret their abortions, um, and these people, these women, do exist. And they are organized. They, uh, the ones who are religious, um, belong to something. Called, some of them belong to something called Rachel's Vineyard, which is a, a Christian organization, especially founded for women who regret their abortions and are mourning their loss and all like that. And those women and women who belong to other similar groups have become very organized. Um, I go to the uh, the last two years, not this year, but the two previous years. I went to the march. Uh, for, for life in Washington, D.C. And these women are there, and they speak from these laminated um, 
documents that they, you know, laminated stories that they've written. And laminated because it's usually snowing or raining, so they have to be able to read. Um, and they tell these stories, and it's always, I talk about this in the book because it's fascinating. What the stories always are is it was the worst thing I ever did. It was really terrible. But, you know, I was pushed into it. People told me I wouldn't feel anything, but my friends, my callous, horrible friends, uh, they told me it was just a lump of tissue, go have an abortion, but here I am 20 years later. Um, and uh, it was only when I found Jesus that I began to heal. Uh, or, you know, my drug dealer boyfriend pushed me into it. It's never, you know, this is what I really did want at the time, even though it was a mistake. It's always a story about I didn't really... I, I'm a good person because it wasn't really my decision. Um, so those women go to state legislatures in many states and they give testimony, um, and which is very influential in state legislatures, where which is where most of people, a lot of people don't realize this, but you as lawyers I'm sure do, which is that state legislatures is where most abortion law takes place. Um, so... Another thing that happens is that our, that um, more liberal people focus obsessively on the president and state uh, senate and congress, and the other side is very into local politics, um, and that's you know that's the Tea Party is all about that, and they have managed to take over the entire state government, all three branches, in at least half the states. Um, so there are many, many states now where um, uh, what anti-choice Republicans and the, you know, some of the, they're, anti, they're also anti-choice Democrats, so them too, what they want to happen happens. There's no, there's no veto. There's no, you know, bottling things up in committee or, or you, you can sometimes, but it's very hard and it's getting harder. So anyway, these this whole discourse where the only people you hear from are the women who, are, who regret, are the women who had a terrible experience at an abortion clinic, um, et cetera, et cetera, those women, their voices is the, is the big voice out there. Um, so when you say listen to women, these are the women that will then come forward. This is terrible. This is just awful. Um, and there are, like in South Dakota, those women were very influential in the passing of um, uh, um, oh, waiting, you know, extended waiting periods and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and these are states, I should say, where there's like only one abortion clinic. Um, and it shows you how uh, incredibly motivated they are that here is one abortion clinic. There's six or seven states now where there's one abortion clinic. Uh, uh, Wyoming has no abortion clinics, um, although it has some doctors who perform abortions like 90 in a year most well Wyoming women have to go out of state um, but anyway you would think that one abortion clinic let's just say we won and go home but no they are very determined to get rid of that one last abortion clinic um, in the states that that have only one so they well, they really have a very triumphalist uh, view that is not about compromise it's not about um, finding some modus vivendi with the majority of Americans who still are, you know, support Roe v. Wade, are still more or less sort of kind of pro-choice. They are about, um, you know, God's on our side, we're right, you're wrong, you're killing babies, we want to save babies. So um, anyway, all that went into um, uh, writing this book in which I discuss... Um, uh, all kinds of, uh, well, I have a chapter on what is a person. What is a person? This whole idea of personhood, which is very important, um, where what does it mean to believe that uh, a fertilized egg is a person? What is the concept of person that would include a fertilized egg that has none of the qualities we think of a person having? Um, and if you do believe a fertilized egg is a person, then you can't be in favor of abortion for rape, abortion for incest, abortion to save the life of the mother, you can't. Because you can't say, oh, well, um, I need your body. <laughs> you know, I need to kill you in order to live um, so I can have your kidney or I can have your heart. You can't do that. And so uh, if you believe a fertilized egg and a 
embryo and all the rest of it are people, you cannot support the kinds of exceptions that most people, most voters, even if they're not uh, in favor of abortion, will support. Um, it's a big contradiction that they never, they, that the anti-choicers never face because the anti-choice organizations do support banning abortion under every under any cir conceivable circumstance, and none of them, I might also add, support um, birth control. There is not one. You know, every you ask an ordinary person, what can we do to lower the abortion rate? They'll say, well, we need more birth control, um, and that does make a certain amount of intuitive sense. Uh, but there is not one pro-choice organization that supports, I'm sorry, anti-choice organization that supports birth control, which they are persuading themselves, even as I speak to you, is also a form of abortion. That they have now redefined the birth control pill and the IUD and emergency contraception as abortion. Um, birth control pills are baby pesticide. Um, and uh, chemical abortion, and the IUD is also, um, you know, some torture device for fetuses. They just have persuaded themselves against all the science uh, that um, that these are abortions, and uh, so they are not interested in making that compromise either. And there are people who have met with. Uh, anti-abortion people, pro-choice people, anti-choice people have been meeting for years in groups like Common Ground. And I have to say they've made no progress at all. Um, I mean, maybe they're better friends, maybe they understand each other more, but the birth, the birth control um, has not, that issue has not moved one bit. Um, so um, anyway, I had the idea that if I could reach, my book is aimed at two audiences. One is pro-choice people to give them better arguments and to, and also the pro-choice movement to sort of wake them up a little bit and have them maybe not be so defensive. Um, the other is what I call the muddled middle. And I'm actually, that phrase actually comes from another writer, um, uh, Roger Rosenblatt, um, but he never returned my phone call and uh, to talk to him about the muddled middle and his book about abortion. And so I, I used the phrase, and I credited him, but everybody thinks that I said it. And since he didn't return my phone call, I'm not going to apologize to him. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, um, um, I hope to reach the muddled middle, the people who, you know, I'm very unhappy about abortion, but I don't want it to be completely illegal. I hoped if I could reframe abortion for them and show how, you know, it's just, it's part, I, what I say is it's part of motherhood. It's not the opposite of motherhood. It's part of it. It's part of the normal course of reproductive life for one in three women in the country. Um, so uh, it's, it's about women making a good decision or the best decision they can under the circumstances about what kind of mother they can be at that particular time in their life. Um, and even if a woman decides she never wants to have children, then she's definitely doing the right thing, I think, because if that's how she feels, she shouldn't be a mother. And being a mother should be a voluntary thing. Uh, we demand immense sacrifices of women who have children. Immense. Um, they suffer uh, economic losses, they suffer uh, the loss of the ability to be in public life, they, um, they never get back to where they were, a lot of them never get back to where they would have been uh, had they not had children. Um, and yet, as I point out, uh, it's not like we say, oh, you're going to have a baby, you're really doing the right thing. We are going to provide you with all this support and wonderfulness that, that every mother and every child deserve to have. Quite the contrary. Quite the opposite. I'm sure you know. It's cut, cut, cut. And in the Republican Party, which is the party that is, a, is firmly allied with the anti-choice movement, I mean, they have thrown in their lot with, with the religious right. Um, on, on uh, many issues, 
Um, it's they are the ones who, the minute they get some power, they cut food stamps, they cut unemployment, um, they 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 cut school funding. They they uh, they are certainly not out there saying, well, yes, we're going to give you some wonderful child care. They basically think that the, the anti-abortion people basically think. Um, if you were sexually continent, then you won't have this problem. I was on a radio program with a Catholic law professor, um, Teresa Hallett, I think is her name, in M Minneapolis. And one of the first things she said was, well, the reason women have abortions is that they lack self-control. Um, and I said, well, come on. I mean, a lot of women who have abortions are married. They're supposed to sleep with their husbands. <laughs> she says, oh, married women don't have abortions. And with instantly, three women called up to say, I'm married. I had an abortion while I was married. Um, but anyway, that's the mentality. that it's, it's, And that's where you see another point I make at great length in the book is that it's really all about, it's about women and it's about sex. That it's about the belief that sex should be tied to reproduction in a very direct way. Um, and that if you don't, that... Making abortion legal is part of why we have this fiesta of licentiousness and hookup culture and everything bad going on now. That's how they think. Um, I did this one. I'll just say this one thing, and then I'll, I'll maybe read for a little bit. Um, but I, um, I did a column in The Nation uh, where I tried so hard to not be my usual sarcastic, snarky self and to just ask open-ended questions and invite anti-choice people to write to me their answers. And the answers were just amazing because it became very clear that, uh, and it wasn't like I got thousands of answers, so it's a very special bunch of people who were writing to me. Nonetheless, uh, it was amazing to me how many people said their view of sex was that Having sex is like a contract to have a baby. You shouldn't do it unless you want to have a baby or will accept having a baby. And you should just be celibate. They really think that. You should just be celibate uh, in marriage or outside of marriage. So conceivably, you could have 10 children having had sex 10 times in your life. Um, and they don't see it the way most people do, which is sex is a part of intimacy, it's pleasure, it's part of what keeps a marriage going, um, and all like that. And it's part of it. You know, no, very few people are virgins when they get married anymore. They, they just, they think, oh yeah, that's true, and that's really awful. <laughs> that's why we need to make abortion illegal. Um, so uh, they are really operating in a very different mental uh, framework than I'm, I'm guessing most people in this room, although maybe you'll surprise me. Um, so I don't, you know, they have a lot more political power than these strange views that they have would suggest. And I think one reason for that is people don't know they have these strange views, so I tried to tell them. Um, and it was very interesting to me that when these people were very honest and when given a chance to explain themselves, they did. But one thing that was interesting was that when one of the questions, I forget how I, I phrased it, but one of the questions was about, you know, what do you think, um, since sex take, takes two, if the woman has to have the baby, what should the consequences be for the man? Uh, they were very uninterested in that. Uh, basically, that well, he has to pay child support. Well, of course, he doesn't really in many uh, real life cases, but also child support isn't exactly comparable to pregnancy and childbirth, um, and child support doesn't really cover the cost of taking care of a child um, unless um, he's very rich. Um, so they were not interested in that, and they also had another strange, uh, another belief that is factually false, which is they believe that there is a lot of help out there for poor people. They believe that charity is enough. Charity and, you know, well, we've got all these welfare programs. What are people complaining about? Um, and there's wonderful, Catholic Charity says wonderful work, and my church is doing wonderful work. They don't have a sense, really, of the scale of the problem of poverty in this country. They, they're still back with the idea that, you know, 
you, you can help your neighbor and that solves everything. Um, and they don't see it in a, as a systematic uh, problem that we have here in, in the United States. They're just, and, and I, I think it's, you know, well, you're lawyers, so you must have the experience or will have the experience often of two different realities that are opposed in a courtroom, you know? The guy is innocent, the guy is guilty, he's guilty with an explanation, you know. Um, but um, I don't quite know how you make people see things that they don't want to see. Um, I think maybe life sometimes butts people up against a reality that's just too big to ignore. Um, but a lot of times that doesn't happen. Um, so anyway, it was my hope that this book would be a positive intervention in this whole discourse that I've told you about, which I'm not going to read to you from because my eyes hurt too much. But um, uh, um, we'll have to see whether that works out. It's gotten very, uh, I'm very gratified. I expected it would get terrible reviews because I expected that all the middle of the road pundits would review it and say, oh, you know, it's too, it's too extreme. Uh, and she's like the, uh, you know, the mirror image of the anti-choice people. But actually, that never happened. And what did happen was that a number of reviewers um, talked about their own abortions in their review, and uh, which was fascinating to me. And then what happened was, and this was a little insulting to me, that when the anti-choice people picked up on these reviews, they would say, well, I haven't read Kat's book, but here's a review. <laughs> Here's a review that where this person says she had an abortion. This is so shocking, and I'm thinking, come on, read the book, read the book. What's your problem here? Um, so uh, um, it's. I think there's there's a little bit of evidence that the discourse is turning around a little bit because a lot of younger uh, pro-choice people are beginning to work on the stigma issue in a big way, breaking down the stigma. Um, and there's one in three is a website where people tell their abortion stories. Um, there's a group called Sea Change that puts out a, a collection of essays about reproductive life and then gets women together to read the book and talk about it, like in a book club. And they find that uh, women will talk much more freely about their own experiences after they've read these, these stories than, and talk to each other than before. Um, and there are, um, there are a whole bunch of... Um, good things happening out there. The question is, will they happen fast enough uh, and reach enough people so that we can turn around what really looks like um, a, a very serious assault on women's rights. So um, that's it. Um, I'd love to take some questions. Yes, Deborah. Right. Yeah. And so, well, I appreciate your, um, you know, pushing this line of, in some sense, abortion without apology, mm -hmm. and, and that is an important voice to hear in the debate, and we don't hear that voice enough. Um, you know, we want a big tent yeah. pro-choice movement, including a pro-choice movement that has people who regret their abortions think it's not a decision they would ever make, but are, yeah. you know, so I'm just trying to understand if yeah. you make, you know, one argument that seems really a good thing, but I think it's important to have a movement that is, and this is the liberal part, right? Yeah. You know, even to say the, the strategy that you say doesn't work, which I agree with you, just being defensive isn't yeah. enough. But some of the defensiveness is to pull out for the person who's not going to say abortion without apology, but might say, yeah, I can understand how there are circumstances that push people you know, to make this as a rational choice, and I would endorse that, but I wouldn't endorse these other cases. So it does seem like some of the defensive strategy has a role for reaching some of the muddle, middle well, I think, as I said, you know, I think a lot of these messagings are focus grouped and uh, uh, 
people agree with them, but I think they're I think that over the long term it hasn't worked out well. And Yes. 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 Well, you know, uh, the wonderful journalist, Irene Carmon, who's on MSNBC all the time, um, she said, you know, their story is very simple, and our story is more complicated, and it is hard to reduce to a soundbite. Um, and abortion without apology is not my soundbite. Uh, my soundbite is abortion is a social good. It's it's good. It's not just good for women to have this option. It's good for men too. You know, we never talk about that, and so it, it, we get this idea. Oh yeah, men. They're always the ones telling their the, the woman not to do it. Um, but actually, it isn't good for men to have children that they're not connected to, that they don't even know are out there. That um, where you know where they're tied to this non-existent pseudo relationship because of a very casual sexual relationship, et cetera, et cetera. That's not good. Um, it's not good for kids to, uh, when their mother is overburdened with children, then she can't give what children need to have to all of them. Um, so I think that, uh, and it's not good for society to lose to unwanted motherhood, which is, we're not talking about wanted motherhood, we're talking about unwanted motherhood. It's not good for society to lose the, so much of the female talent in the world, um, which, which happens a lot. So I try to make the case that abortion is just, is just a very good thing for society to have, make available to those who want it, and it should be done without a whole lot of fuss and bother. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting to see the pushback on that idea from anti-choicers, because they want to say that you can be an anti-choice society like Ireland, and everything's great for women in Ireland. Everything's not great for women in Ireland. Ireland's an extremely patriarchal country, um, and uh, or Poland, you know, oh great. But what the real story with Ireland and Poland uh, is that women, women leave the country to have abortions. Um, so they get to say, you know, we don't have this problem, but in fact, of course, they do. Um, so anyway, um, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I'm not a professional, uh, you know, PR person. I wasn't trying to do that. I was just saying, I think what's happened now is people, people, a lot of people have this idea, it's all, you know, abortion is safe, you know, all this stuff, all this, it's just around the edges, it's all fine. Um, they, they don't have a sense of urgency because they just don't think it's a, a big, important issue which it is. Um, if you all could come down to the microphones, it's the best organizing principle for questions. Yeah. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, my, uh, my grandmother asked me if I'd take a picture of the Pope when he came to Washington, D.C., where I was living at the time, and maybe some photojournalistic instinct in me framed a picture with a protester uh, holding up a sign saying, uh, sexism is a sin, sinner repent, and the Pope is right behind. And my, my grandmother looked at the picture and she said, oh good, yes, yeah, sex is a sin. Uh, it's good, good to have that sign there. And uh, about 15 years ago, I, I wrote a paper with Steve Steve Levitt, um, trying to explain why crime had fallen in the 1990s and uh, postulated the the impact of Roe versus Wade uh, reducing the number of unwanted children, and so I got a lot of blowback from from that paper. And one of the people who who was very critical of me uh, was you know saying you know abortion is murder and stuff. And I said, well, you know, of course you can achieve the same goal without abortion if you would you know promote uh, contraception more and you would reduce the number of unwanted children, et cetera. And he said, well, the, the only thing worse than abortion would be to do that because then there would be so much more rampant sex. And so at least in this, in, in many domains, it, it, uh -huh. it's picking up on a theme that you've mentioned that sex does seem to be the original sin that uh, uh, drives some of this because if you try to push uh, at least the people who have that view towards a greater endorsement of, of contraception, uh, there, there does seem to be yeah. uh, 
some serious blowback. So I, I don't yeah. know if you've got that same message, but I got that, that one pretty strongly, at least from that well, one. Well, that's a great story about your grandmother. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, so sort of going to that, trying to untangle like what's motivating the, the anti-choice movement. Um, something that occurred to me is that part of it is this idea of like the war on the family and that we, we really, we want to have women at home with children and for you know yeah. women to not be tied down by children and to have these kind of career options in some way undermines that other option and um, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to, to the role that sort of that line of, of thinking and rhetoric is well I think that there are some definitely some anti-choicers who would like to reconstitute the old patriarchal family um, and they see abortion birth control and you know all that sex sinful sex as working against that. Um, but there are others who will say, look, you can. You, I have 10 children and I'm having a wonderful life. Um, and I correspond with um, anti, an anti-choice woman who has a lot of kids and, you know, she's getting a PhD in theology I and mean, she has a, a wonderful life. Now she also has a wonderful husband who supports her and all those children. Um, so, uh, but I think it's this Teresa Hallett um, who I debated the, the, on, the, on the radio, she's a law professor. Um, so I think that uh, Marianne, who is it I'm thinking of? This is so terrible. Uh, Marianne Glendon at Harvard Law, who is a professor of law and was the envoy to the Vatican briefly, I believe. Um, she's a very accomplished woman who is completely anti-choice. In fact, I read something by her where she said she would restrict birth control to married people. <laughs> you know, so, um, so it comes in all kinds, but I think definitely there is a, a longing for an older, theoretically more stable, and inevitably more male-dominant kind of uh, family, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Hi. Thanks very much for the book, and I, I hope it has its great impact. Um, you, you said that um, abortion is about women and sex, and I wonder if we could add to that it's about women and sex and the law. Mm -hmm. um, I worry when we talk about um, putting the responsibility on individual women to raise their voices out there alone um, to speak up, um, whereas it should be done as a movement and there should be a movement which makes a demand that the law is impartial towards women and men. And I think we all pretty much know that if men needed abortions, it would be free and available. Um, but it's discriminatory against women. And I wonder if you, you or anyone else in the room could speak to what law is available to support women's um, campaign for free and available abortions. Well, there are, you know, huge lawsuits going on even as we speak, trying to uh, turn back the tide of all the bad laws. Um, but I think, I think most of the uh, pro-choice movement is, is concentrated on trying to overturn all the bad things that are happening. Um, and that there are only a few examples of trying to move forward, like in New York State, for example, trying to get uh, abortion law um, to mirror Roe, which it does not quite. That's become this huge flashpoint where uh, the state Senate just doesn't want to do that. Um, so um, I think there's definitely room to make our laws more more just and fair. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your talk and your analysis. I was wondering, I was thinking as you spoke about the work of Jonathan Hates on his Five Pillars of Morality and how uh, Jonathan Hates basically in a very crude way, it says that there are five different sort of rhetorics for discussing and thinking about ethics and that 
conservatives, particularly in this case, the anti-choice movement, tends to really focus on particularly sanctity and purity, whereas liberals, we tend to focus on uh, justice and fairness oh, right. and these yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. And so arguments just pass as ships in the night. Um, and that making the social point of social utility or you know fairness to people from a low socioeconomic background really doesn't address the crux of the opposition to abortion. And I was wondering if you could speak on what we could do to really address the issue of abortion is murder on that level, on a purity or sanctity level that would really maybe change minds as opposed to just not addressing the same issues. Well, I would like to hear from somebody who had a good argument about that because I think if you, once you put things on a level of sanctity and purity, then uh, it's very hard. I mean, you know, I read the Bible. There's nothing in the abor in, about abortion in the Bible, not one word. And in fact, if you uh, look at the examples that are kind of sometimes used as references to abortion, it's pro-choice, actually. There are circumstances in the, in the Old Testament where abortion is, uh, happens and is required and all like that. And if you look at um, the Talmud, if you look at the Jewish scholars have been reading the Old Testament for 2,000 years, and they are not, they do not find in it the anti-choice message that, you know, the Pope finds in it. So I think that um, it's very hard to make, I mean, unless we're going to spend the rest of our lives in theology, it's very hard to make, you know, the kind of argument that you're looking for. But I think what you can do is um, uh, you can show people you can complicate it. You know, that if somebody believes it's okay to have an abortion for rape, then maybe you can ex say, well, okay, so maybe you don't believe it's always murder. Or if you believe it's always murder, sometimes you think it's justifiable. So maybe we could talk about some other circumstances. Or maybe, you know, even if you could bring them to say, okay, I still think it's wrong to have an abortion if you're poor, but now I'm committed <laughs> to, you know, to uh, supporting every mother and every child. Then you've made some progress, um, but I think that uh, as long as things are about religion, all you can do is point out, like, okay, that's your reading of the Bible, but then what do you say about it to Episcopalians, to Presbyterians, to Methodists, to Reform and Conservative, and even sometimes Orthodox Jews who read the same books and are all pro-choice under many, many circumstances? What do you say about that? And then are they going to say, well, they're heretics and they'll burn in hell? Um, there actually are few religions that are totally opposed to abortion. Most have a, a sort of massaged middle kind of position. But anyway, yeah, sanctity, purity, that's that's tough. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I agree. Uh, women have a right to abortion, no restrictions. I'm just wondering about one of your arguments uh, where you say that putting restrictions and so on uh, is indicating that we don't trust women, what women don't have the capacity to make these decisions. But someone could argue that what you're saying is doing the same thing when you say that uh, you shouldn't show like a sonogram to a woman. Isn't that kind of saying, well, a woman can handle that, she'd be emotional or something? No, I didn't say that though. I didn't say you shouldn't show her. I no, no, but I mean, but make it required. Why not? Isn't it kind of informed consent? No. Um, is it informed? What if I'm pregnant, as I have been, and I go to the doctor and he says, oh, you're pregnant. Um, now, I have to tell you all the terrible things that can happen to you as a result of pregnancy and childbirth, up to and including death. Um, and so I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to read you this list of possible consequences of your pregnancy. And then I want you to come back in 24 hours or 72 hours and tell me if you want to continue. Um, we never do that. We don't do that with any other decision. Um, yeah, but it's not a medical procedure. Abortion is a medical wait, pre procedure. Wait, childbirth is a, pregnancy and childbirth are very medical no, 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 procedures. But it's a kind of surgery. No, I, no, I, well, I what if it, so what if it's not? I don't not, think there okay. should be restrictions. But what if it's but not no, surgery? Why, but what if, if it someone is a, requires yeah. you to see a sonogram, aren't you saying that, well, that might influence the woman's decision? In other words, a woman couldn't handle it somehow. Don't no. Well, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I, 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 I think, first of all, it's not always a surgical decision. It's often a medical, it's often, you know, there's pill, abortion it's by pill. It's a medical intervention. Um, well, okay, if I want to have any kind of surgery, 
the information I get is about me and the, the effects on me. Nobody says, if you have plastic surgery, has it occurred to you that your husband might just be really freaked out? Um, you know, I mean, it's all about the woman and her health consequences. Many women do want to see the sonogram. I mean, this is something that, that the idea that if you see the sonogram, you won't have, have the abortion is false. Um, you might be upset or you might just resent being forced to do something that has no medical purpose. But very a tiny percentage of women change their minds about this. And I think the truth is most women have seen sonographs. They've been through this already. Um, it, to get so, me, I agree yeah. with you. I don't think yeah. sonograms should be required. I'm just saying that on the other side could use that argument, just saying that you don't trust women. So just, just something to think about. Okay, I'll think okay. about it. There's probably a lot in what you say. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, thanks for coming. I found it really fascinating. I think one of your most powerful arguments is that the anti-choice side seems to think that sex is this thing you can have 10 times an hour. And um, I've actually been thinking a lot about the theology of that argument. The Catholic Church supposedly saying that sex is only for reproduction, but at the same time fully endorsing married couples who are, for example, postmenopause or who are infertile. And that is a contradiction that I can't say anything intelligent about, but I'm wondering if that has perhaps led to maybe a division within religious communities of saying, well, you're clearly endorsing sex for purposes beyond mere reproduction. For example, as you say, you know, marital uh, intimacy, just, you know, the kind of human aspect of it. And if that perhaps has led to a growing movement um, of, you know, pro-choice movement within religious communities and how we can incorporate them. Well, what a fascinating, um, what a fascinating question. I wish I knew more. We should have some, we should have some priests here to tell us. I mean, the Catholic Church no longer says that sex is only for reproduction. They say it has to be open to life. So... In their view, theoretically, even uh, a person who has um, gone through menopause is theoretically open to life because God can do all kinds of wonderful things. Um, you just never know. Um, they bring out this argument mostly when they are talking about gay marriage. That see, marriage has to be open to life. Therefore, it can't be. It has to be between a man and a woman. Um, so. Um, I think we have to, you know, leave it to the theologians. I mean, see, this is the other thing. You know, look what's happened. We we spent all this time talking about what Catholics think. You know, but really, it shouldn't matter. We don't live in a theocracy. Um, they they should be, you know, they're welcome to their views, and if they can persuade their followers to live the way they want, fine. But there's no reason why everybody has to live according to these strictures, especially when very few Catholics, Catholics use birth control at the same rate as everybody else, and they have abortions at the same rate as everybody else. Um, so it's ridiculous to, you know, for the church to claim, you know, we see the truth for everybody. And when they can't even persuade their own followers, if people in the pews, they can't persuade them. So... Um, I think that it, the, the fact that that's the way this discussion is going is fascinating because it shows how related to religion the whole abortion, the whole abortion issue is. Um, and this doesn't happen in other countries. This is the other fascinating thing, that uh, in the countries of Western Europe where abortion is legal, they do not have an enormous organized uh, anti-choice movement that, you know, sits in at clinics and bombs and murders and all and goes on about it all the time. They just don't have that. And there's something special. You know, talk about American exceptionalism. There's something very special about America and abortion. I don't really know what it is, but it has something to do with our Puritanism, with the strength of, um, of religious institutions in this country as opposed to in other countries, some other countries, and with just a very uncompromising sense of, um, you know, morality, uh, quote, morality, unquote. And also, another idea I have, which I'll just throw out, is uh, in America, America is in some ways the country where feminism has, has gone the farthest um, it, and the earliest. That, uh, but it's a particular kind of feminism. It's, the, it's, it's more an individualistic feminism than it is the social welfare, we're all in this together kind of feminism. 
And what you would find in a country like Scandinavia, they don't talk about abortion in the same way. They talk about it as health care, uh, for example, um, which is something, and, and it's sort of a, they, they do talk about it. It's a normal part of life and it's part of families and all that good stuff. And they also do a lot more to take care of women and children. And they have a lot of abortion in Scandinavia. Um, and, uh, but I think that there's something about the way uh, the resistance to feminism in America also, the real misogynist hatred of it that con connected very strongly with the anti-abortion uh, movement. Um, and, uh, but, you know, that's all just theoretical. theoretical. Truth is, I don't know. I don't know. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Yeah. Regarding, regarding the influence of Catholicism on um, abortion and birth control, um, I'm asking a question I wouldn't have asked yesterday, which is because the Archbishop of San Francisco has just, to my knowledge today, um, indicated that he will convene a committee to help him, and these are my words, soften um, an edict he has laid out for high school teachers that was very restrictive that called them to heal to the Catholic uh, doctrine. And there was such an, a hue and a cry, demonstrations by students, parents, staff, that for the first time I can recall, the Catholic Church is seeming to um, bow to some sort of public pressure on their policies. So again, a question I wouldn't have asked yesterday. Um, do you think that there's any possibility um, that public pressure could ever influence the Catholic Church in a more significant, even than the San Francisco um, situation? I ask also as a Planned Parenthood clinic escort who has for some three years now, up and down the peninsula at Planned Parenthood clinics, seen demonstrators harass and truly limit, inhibit access to healthcare clinics. It isn't just in South Dakota or Texas. Right. With our laws, we are nonetheless under siege. Yeah. Um, well, great question. Um, basically, I think no. Uh, public pressure is not going to cause the Catholic Church to change. I think um, even the Pope, who everybody loves, it's for him it's like, you know, you can't just wrap it on about abortion and uh, um, gay marriage all the time. Uh, you have to be more uh, reaching out to people and be more about the total message of the gospel. Um, but I think that we will, I'd, I would be amazed if anyone in this room lived to see the Catholic Church say, okay, abortion is okay. I think they really branded themselves with this issue a long time ago. Um, so, But they, they could talk about it less. They could just say, well, look, we, it's a pluralistic society. We're just going to withdraw from the political arena on this subject. They could do that. Um, but I don't think they can say, you know, we were reading the Bible wrong all those years. I don't think they can do that. But thank you also for your, your remarks about clinic escorting in California. I've done a little bit of that in New York City, and those people are just very, um, very aggressive. And it's really a tragedy that the Supreme Court didn't see it that way, and it was all kindly grandmas trying to give good advice to, you know, women in trouble, because um, it really isn't like that. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, this might have to be the I'll last I'll just question. be really brief. Yeah. Um, I think that the greatest tragedy Having been in, in was actually in a country at the end of the Soviet Union um, where abortion, there was not much abortion at all, nor was there stigma, nor was there any economic problem with having enough for every child who was born, whether the grandparents raised it or the sister or the sister-in-law raised the child because the woman went back to university or whatever. And so I think that the greatest tragedy is the great hypocrisy with what we're talking about, our religions were all created for social justice and the lack of economic support. If we were to tell these women that pro-anti-choice, whatever, 
Oh, you need to have it. You having a child? We're going to tell you not to have an abortion. And we're going to support the child for the whole life of the child so that it has equal opportunity for at every level. It feels like that economics, the social stigma, and throw the last stone, you know, this whole business. All we're doing is giving stigma and non-economic support and suffering and calling it religion. It's like hypocrisy is enthroned. It is like hypocrisy is, is enthroned, but hopefully we'll turn it around. Um, and I hope I made a little contribution to that with my book. And thank you all for coming. Great, great question.